Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Almost hidden in the top left-hand corner of this painting, the artist Paul Gauguin has written in French these three questions. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Like many other people, I have puzzled over the nature of human existence for a long time. And my work as a documentary filmmaker has given me opportunities to consider these great mysteries from many different angles. And I've found increasingly that some of the most helpful and challenging contributions to my quest have come from the work of the Austrian philosopher and educationalist Rudolf Steiner. This film is about Steiner's life and about the work that his ideas and insights have inspired in all areas of human life. Ideas that challenge us to ponder on the true nature of the human being. In Gauguin's words, what are we? Steiner would probably add, and what might we become? Rudolf Steiner challenges us to be more conscious. More conscious and also, I think, to ground our consciousness in, in uh, the warmth of heart. And I, I, I feel one of the most important things about Steiner is actually that he encourages us to, to bring th thinking and, and feeling together, so head and heart together. For me, meeting the work of Rudolf Steiner was like um, finding water in the desert because I had searched and searched for through many different spiritual paths, very much in the East and also, also in the West, including the spiritual path of modern science. I can't think of anybody else who simultaneously follows the whole uh, philosophical and scientific tradition uh, within the West and within modernity, studies it carefully, uh, it, it becomes uh, very competent in its different disciplines, and at the same time is a uh, is, is is clearly a, a, a mystic. I think the challenge for me is to individualize what he has given. As he was in Norway, he almost always in his talks said, don't believe what I'm saying. You have to try it in life. Try it in life. And for me, that's my inner direction. I have to try it out and not just take it for granted. It is like this and then life becomes so exciting. I think really Steiner is about love, but it's hard to get to that realization because of the so many thoughts, you know, so many thoughts. But when I think of him, I don't always think of the thoughts, though I'm impressed by them, of course. I think much more of this man, you know, traveling and drafty trains in the middle of the night to go to the next city to meet with, you know, nine people who are trying to figure something out, or people just claw, scratching at him constantly for help. So he was a servant. So he wasn't a privileged person, he was a servant. So I think it's about love, really. Rudolf Steiner's influence, particularly through his indications about education, agriculture, and medicine, is increasingly apparent. There are seven Rudolf Steiner Waldorf schools in India and over a thousand worldwide, plus communities for those with learning difficulties, as well as hundreds of farmers working with his suggestions of how to not only produce healthier food, but also how to heal the earth in the process. Waldorf schools, 
Biodynamic Agriculture, Velida, Demeter, Hauschka, Camp Hill, these names are increasingly familiar all over the world. In South India, I visited a group of small-scale farmers learning about the influence not just of the sun and the moon on plant growth and health, but also of the planets, a reminder of what in many parts of the world is still not totally forgotten. Rudolf Steiner shared this knowledge, in part based on traditional wisdom, in a course of lectures to farmers in Central Europe in 1924, a year before he died. An awareness of the influence of the planetary constellations, and including when you sow what, is also central to biodynamic agriculture a worldwide movement informed and inspired by that course of lectures delivered at a time when farmers were already expressing concern about the effect that chemical fertilizers were having on the soil and on the health and quality of their produce. The beauty of uh, Dr. Rudolf Steiner is that he was not just a philosopher living in a world of ideas and uh, just philosophizing and just thinking. He brought all these ideas to practical uh, human activity, whether it's agriculture, education, medicine, architecture. Rudolf Steiner himself grew up beside railway lines. His father was a station master, and the exciting new world of trains was ever present. Steiner was two years old when, in 1863, his father was transferred to this station at Potschach in Lower Austria. He lived here until he was eight. Steiner wrote in his autobiography of his deep appreciation for the unspoiled landscape in which he grew up. Despite the new technology on his doorstep, Life for the young boy was essentially simple, simple but far from cosy. Here Steiner lived not only in the two worlds of trains and nature, both of which he loved, but also in an inner world of spiritual experiences that were as real to him as the physical world around him. Already around the age of seven, he had a vivid experience of a relative who had just committed suicide and who asked him for help. But it was to be almost 40 years before he could speak openly about such matters. What is the true nature of reality? Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? These were questions that were to occupy Rudolf Steiner for the rest of his life. In 1868, the family moved nearer to Vienna, to the village of Neudorf. By now, Steiner had a younger brother and sister. Though less remote than Potschach, his home was still, in Steiner's words, austere but healthy. He served as an altar boy at the local Catholic church, helped grow vegetables for the family, but the essence of his journey through childhood and youth, that long walk to school, was the story of a very bright but essentially lonely child, nudged by his father to study science and technology to qualify as an engineer on the railways, who was nevertheless thinking deeply about what he called the enigmas of existence, and already at the age of 14 studying the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. In 1879, at the age of 18, he passed his school leaving examination with distinction. For three years, he'd given private tuition to fellow pupils in order, he wrote, to contribute at least a little of what my parents had to pay out of their meagre income for my schooling. And having attended a technical rather than a grammar school, he had had to teach himself Latin and Greek. From the Austrian countryside in which Steiner had grown up, as the son of a humble railway official, the move to Vienna was a huge step. Capital of the vast Habsburg Empire, 
It was a cosmopolitan city buzzing with life, creativity and philosophical debate. A cultural flowering on a massive scale. In the autumn of that same year, Steiner enrolled at the Technical University to study biology, chemistry, physics and mathematics. But already his interests were as much in German philosophy and literature as in science. Very soon his social life began to flourish. The famous Café Greensteidel, which for a time he gave as his address, is now more a tourist attraction than a hive of philosophical debate. But round the corner at this nearby coffee house, it is easier to imagine the atmosphere of that era and the extraordinary variety of people with whom the young Steiner was mixing. Poets, rich merchants, Cistercian monks, feminists, university professors and poor students like himself. I asked two young customers, both of whom knew something about Steiner's life and legacy, whether the sort of discussions that Steiner and others had in coffee houses like this one were a thing of the past. Those dialogues really to sit hours and hours, yeah, and to develop an idea. I think you can't find that in, in that way anymore. Do you think that's sad? In a way, yes, because I'm old fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm, I'm quite open to, to new ways of, of dialogues. Yeah. Yeah. And I think especially the communication through the net is an enormous, enormous chance. Yeah. Opportunity. Yeah. Opportunity, yeah. 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 So you're optimistic about the future in that sense, are you? I'm very optimistic, yeah. yeah. And to me, uh, the idea it's, it's always a question, how would Steiner act uh, in, in those days? Yeah? Would he use the internet or not? I think he would. Yes, definitely. Yeah. He would be very, very open to our ways and our chances and our opportunities to communicate, to develop, to work together. Not everyone interested in Steiner's work would agree with Bipper about Steiner and the internet. Not only because he, like many others, recognised that technological advances ever since the printing press were no replacement for face-to-face -face human encounters, but also that the mindset behind such devices could, if we remain unconscious, take us on a slippery slope in which our entire world gradually becomes dehumanised. What Steiner made clear, however, is that all such decisions have finally to rest with the individual. His main message, especially to me, um, was or is uh, that he wants us to stand up um, for our own ideas. And that's, especially in our uh, time, not that easy. So for people, it's, it's much more easy to put him into a box than to focus his message and follow the message. And I think he didn't want us to follow him. He wanted us to follow ourselves. Although Steiner had an increasingly wide circle of friends, he was at the same time following his own inner voice. But, like all of us, he needed his awakeners, people who actually change your life. On his regular train journey from home into Vienna, he met such a person, a man with whom he could at last share his inner life of spiritual experiences. Felix Koguski was a herbalist who travelled into Vienna to sell to apothecaries the medicinal herbs he'd gathered in the countryside. On his back, wrote Steiner in his autobiography, were his bundles of herbs, but in his heart was the knowledge of the spiritual aspects of nature that had come to him through gathering them. 
Through Felix, Steiner learned that there existed a vast store of traditional wisdom that was soon to disappear completely from the folk culture of Central Europe. In his company, Steiner felt in touch with what he called a soul from ancient times, someone with the intuitive knowledge that he himself had experienced since childhood and which he was already trying to understand and above all to anchor in the world of modern day consciousness. But there was another ingredient that Steiner was to increasingly emphasize. For every step that we take in our search for this deeper wisdom, we need to take three steps in our moral development. A person should not be on this journey he wrote some 25 years later, to accumulate learning as one's own treasure of knowledge, but in order to place this learning in the service of the world. Meanwhile, the young Steiner was to experience another great awakener, a man who was also to profoundly influence the course of his life. Among the great personalities of the German-speaking world, both past and present, he became inspired by the work of the literary giant Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who had died some 50 years earlier. Not Goethe just as poet and novelist, but Goethe as scientist, particularly his work in anatomy, optics and botany. Later, Steiner was to call him the Copernicus and the Kepler of the organic world. Goethe was a huge influence on Steiner, and, and Steiner felt that he discovered um, a kindred spirit in, in Goethe, because he was approaching the natural world with, a, a, with an open heart and not as an object to be uh, studied and measured and quantified, but rather as a world that was still imbued with something sacred. I think Goethe was very aware of the sacredness of nature and that's why he wanted to approach it in a different way, with, with empathy, rather than with objectifying consciousness. But he still thought of himself as a scientist, didn't he, Goethe? He certainly did, because he was interested in, in knowledge, and in a, in a type of knowledge that was a direct knowing, really a perceiving, to actually see into the spiritual um, workings of nature. So he was focused much more on the world of qualities than of quantities, and much more on what could be perceived by each person as a, as a, a human being, unaided by any scientific instruments. So for him, scientific instruments tended to get in the way of really seeing what was living in nature. That's why he's so much at odds with uh, the approach of mainstream science. Jeremy Nadler is a writer with a doctorate in theology and religious studies who makes his living as a gardener in Oxford. For Goethe, the, the human being is the most exact instrument. If you can develop that instrument into a, uh, an organ of, of uh, deep perception, then, of course, you'll, you'll see more and more in nature, and that's what Steiner was able to do. He, he developed himself as, a, of a, 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 as a, a, a spiritual instrument, I suppose. So he was perceiving much more than most people are able to perceive in the natural world. And he extended that to, to invisible worlds, of course. And was, was, was pointing to the fact that we all have this potential then. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not so easy to develop it though. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, one just has to keep working at it, really on a daily basis. What, what is your understanding of the key to working with it then? Well, when I go into the gardens, I. I'm very aware that the first thing I, I want to do is, you know, I see weeds and, you know, and I, I see all sorts of things that need doing. So I want to get engaged with practical stuff. But I try to stop myself and just 
spend at least a few minutes with a plant and just observe it, just be with it. And there's something immensely centering and healing in, in doing that. And I feel it actually helps the rest of my, my day in the garden. You realize that there's a miracle there, really. And it's so easy to not see it. Yeah. But that would be true, perhaps, of life altogether. We just simply don't notice things, do we? We take things for granted. Yeah. Not just plants. That's absolutely true of life altogether. Goethe does provide a kind of transition, a, a, a foundation for a transition between, I might say, conventional day consciousness and what Steiner calls ultimately his spiritual science. That is to say, a, a way of engaging the world of uh, spirit, the world of our own inner experiences, with as much surety and, and clarity as we do the outer world. I'm going to remind you of what we saw at the very beginning of our class. Remember, there was a little Wimshurst machine here that allows us to do something very similar. Slightly different geometry, but basically... A Arthur Zions is an American professor of physics at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Alongside his interest in Steiner, and through his connection with the work of the Dalai Lama, he is a pioneer in bringing the practice of meditation into academic circles. I asked Arthur to explain the young Steiner's interest in the philosopher Immanuel Kant, and in particular Steiner's rejection of Kant's hugely influential utterances on the limits to knowledge. The limits, the so-called limits to knowledge, are really the limits of a horizon. You know, if you stand on a mountaintop, you see further than if you're down in the valley. Well, but you've got to get to the mountaintop, right? So yes, you could say there are limits to knowledge if you're in a particular location, but there's nothing to keep you from developing yourself to a higher extent, it's like climbing the mountain, and seeing further. There'll still be an horizon, so you'll still experience a, a limit, but the limit is a subjective limit, not an objective statement about the way the world is organized. So yes, you could say Steiner recognized that there are, in the moment, certain limits to knowledge, but that these are not part of our human nature. Human nature is, in some ways, inexhaustible. Everything that can be known, can be known by the human being. We are, in that sense, in the image of God. We are filled with the potential for the most profound and extraordinary way of knowing. I looked at it more carefully and then saw in its leaves, it does something incredible. That the lower leaves are long-stalked and kidney-shaped, and they, they form a little rosette. There are only three of them still alive. There were more earlier on. Then a little ways up the main stem, you have the next leaf, which also has a long stalk, but is already in its blade. Craig Holdridge has also had a long interest in Steiner and threw Steiner into the work of Goethe. In upstate New York, he has founded the Nature Institute, where observation, the kind of meditative observation that Steiner practiced over many years, is explored. We founded the Nature Institute with the um, intention of having a place that can cultivate a particular way of knowing that can bring us back more in relationship with nature and the things themselves. And now, that sounds, you know, very harmless and simple and maybe not even that important, but if you think about how strongly our culture and our minds are captivated with certain kind of abstract ideas, and we notice that people come to us with many, many abstractions in their minds about what hormones do, about what the brain does, about how nat natural selection has made us this way or that way. And we have all these explanations of the world, but do we see the world? Do we experience the world anymore? And of course, with our technologically dominated culture, this is, becomes more and more an issue. Goethe said something like, 
Um, if we want to gain a living understanding of nature, we must make ourselves as mobile and flexible as nature herself. So science as transformation of the human being to understand the living character of the world. That's the mission of the Nature Institute. When Steiner came across Goethe's work when he was, he was still a student at the University in Vienna, what he found in Goethe, what stimulated him in Goethe, was that here was a man who really immersed himself in the phenomenal world, didn't have lots of abstract concepts, and thereby opened himself to seeing relationships that um, spoke of more than the mere physical. It's, it is just unfortunate today that we, we are so, so much in a dualistic culture, you know, matter and mind, soul, and, or body and spirit, um, if we even think about the one half, right? But if, if we do think about the spiritual or the soul or whatever, then it's always in contrast to the body or this. That, that, but to see a unified world, and that was really Steiner in his epistemology based on Goethe, was all about the one world that we live in. It is one world, and we are part of one world. And there aren't two or three or 50. There might be um, nuances and different levels or whatever you want to call them, um, different uh, aspects that one can gain access to, but it is one manifoldly differentiated world. In this ap approach to understanding the world, you really do have to slow down. So I, you know, sometimes thought about, you know, this methodology or this aspect of the methodology that it would be interesting to speak of, like one speaks of slow food today and slow money, to speak of slow science. We need to slow down so that we can really dwell in the things as a basis of a more, <clears throat> as, as the basis of a deeper understanding of the world. Towards each other too, then. Yes. I mean, in all respects, I speak mainly about, when I'm speaking about nature, I'm also speaking about my fellow human beings, right? In all our relationships, this, you know, taking the time. One set of relationships that Steiner had while still studying in Vienna, and which was to have far-reaching consequences, took place in this building, the home of the Specht family. Steiner tutored the four boys during his last six years in Vienna, while at the same time studying and writing on Goethe. Of particular concern to his parents was Otto, ten years old when Steiner first met him and considered by everyone as both physically and mentally abnormal and therefore uneducable. With Steiner's help, Otto's condition gradually improved and eventually he became a doctor. There is now a whole movement for therapeutic education with schools and villages, not only here on the banks of the Seven Estuary in England, but all over the world. A movement inspired by the lecture Steiner gave in 1924, drawing on his experience with Otto, as well as on his own insights into the makeup of the human being and the abnormalities that can occur. Rudolf Steiner's own next challenge was the editing of Goethe's scientific papers, as well as writing his key book, The Philosophy of Freedom. In 1891, at the age of 30, he was awarded a doctorate of philosophy from the University of Rostock. A year earlier, he'd moved to Weimar. It was to be a lonely seven years, working within the formality of the Goethe-Schiller archives and with no one with whom he could discuss his increasingly rich inner life of spiritual experiences. Meanwhile, his philosophical writings and insights remained largely unrecognized. I discovered Steiner when I was in my early 20s, and I was at Oxford uh, in a, at the university in a highly intellectualized environment which i hated and studying studying f philosophy yeah. well ppe which includes philosophy philosophy was the thing that i was really interested in keen on and it was just agony for me i hated it 
it was Bertrand Russell and David Hume and every manner of reductionist thinker that you could imagine. And there was no real philosophy. And then I came across Steiner's work and it was a godsend to me because there was someone talking about thinking, but in a completely different way from the abstract, intellectualized thinking that's practiced in the universities. So Can you describe what that view is then? I mean, what was well, this alternative? Well, <laughs> one of Steiner's key books is The Philosophy of Spiritual Activity, or The Philosophy of Freedom, as those two different titles. And in that book, he, he describes how thinking as an activity can be intensified so that it becomes a kind of dialogue with the, the world of spirit. And that seemed to me to be a, a path that I could follow. But when you say world of spirit, I mean, you know, that can sound pretty weird to some people. Are you, are you talking about talking to spiritual beings? Or what do you mean by the world of spirit? Well, yes, I do. <laughs> it may, may well sound weird, but I think that's the reality of it, yes. But of course, one, one's actually um, in a kind of inner dialogue with, a, with a, a world of thoughts, but the, the question is, what is the source of our thinking? Where do, do, where do our thoughts come from? The, that's a, a living question, which I think anyone who's engaged with, with um, that question of what thinking really is, is, is obliged to ask. I mean, most people would probably say that our thoughts come from our brain. Most people probably would say that, yes. Well, I don't think that's actually correct. And, and even to the extent, of course, thinking is dependent on, on our having a brain. So if you cut my head off, I wouldn't be able to think. <laughs> but, but it doesn't mean that, that um, the source of thinking is uh, material. How long must I be silent, was the question that Rudolf Steiner was asking himself as he reached the age of 40, unable still to share his experiences of what he called die geistige Welt, the spiritual world. In 1897, he moved to Berlin, initially to edit an avant-garde literary and theatrical magazine. But it wasn't only to intellectuals and artists that he was drawn. As a result, he was asked to give courses in history at a workers' educational institute, a post he held for seven years. But among the citizens of Berlin, as elsewhere in Europe and beyond, were an increasing number of people interested in spiritual teachings, in the case of the Theosophists, in a wisdom with its roots in the East. Here at last was an audience eager to listen to someone not just speaking out of the past, but out of his own inner vision. But what was becoming the most powerful experience of all finally brought about the break with many of these early followers. For the Theosophists, Jesus Christ was just one of many great teachers throughout history. For Steiner, Christ's incarnation as a deed of huge cosmic significance became a powerful and transformative experience. It's not a sectarian understanding of Christ, so I think he's, he's not wanting to associate Christ too closely with the Christian church. I mean, I think the Christian church, sadly, is all too sectarian sometimes. Um, for Steiner, it's, um, it's a strong view of how humanity as a whole is transformed by Christ. Fraser Watts is a priest in the Church of England and someone with a long interest in the work of Rudolf Steiner. He's also a fellow of Queen's College, Cambridge, and reader in theology and science. There's been quite a big tendency in the 20th century to... Um, 
to do a retreat to some kind of subjective or existential understanding of Christianity. But Steiner is absolutely in, going in the opposite direction. For him, it is just an objective fact that the um, evolution of human consciousness was changed by Christ. I mean, take it or leave it. I mean, and, and even if no one had known about that, even if there had never been anyone of Christian faith, for Steiner, I think that transformation of human consciousness would still have happened as a result of the work of Christ. The church at Potschach, in the village where Steiner lived until he was eight years old. As a child and throughout his life, he was drawn to a great variety of people, priests included. In his autobiography, he describes his father as a free thinker. For Steiner himself, what increasingly mattered was knowledge. But the kind of knowledge in which science and religion, faith and reason are not at odds. A scientist of the invisible is how he has sometimes been described. I think the distinctive thing about Steiner's approach to that is to want to find some scientific approach to religious and spiritual questions. There are different ways of bringing science and religion into dialogue, but I think that's what's distinctive, to approach, um, um, I think he would say, the spiritual rather than the religious, but to approach the spiritual in a scientific way. He clearly has exceptional powers. Because they're so unusual, it's hard to know quite how to characterise those, but he's clearly some kind of clairvoyant. And he's unusually disciplined and highly trained in the way he uses those clairvoyant powers. And he has such a serious sense of purpose um, to um, leave the world a better place as a result of his mission. And arising out of that, all this great outpouring of practical activity and I don't know of anyone else who, who um, spans all those things, really, has the exceptional powers, is so disciplined with them, so purposeful and so practical. I think that's a unique contribution. Why is Steiner not better known, do you think? It's an interesting question why Steiner isn't better known. I think there are various reasons. Um, there's something off-putting about his writings. I think that that has to be said. What style, you mean? Yes, yes, yes. Style and content, I think. And, and also something off-putting about the society, the kind of following that he has sometimes built up around him, which can look rather too cult-like from the outside. Not at all what he wanted, I think, but it can look like that. The network of people interested in Steiner's ideas is worldwide and growing. Here, in Hyderabad in South India, several hundred are gathering for a conference of the Asia-Pacific region of the Anthroposophical Society. Anthroposophy being the name Steiner chose for his movement after his break with the Theosophists. Most, if not all, of these people would reject the notion of a cult in that as teachers, farmers, doctors and therapists, although interested and inspired by Steiner's insights, they are working hard to make these insights their own and to take them further, as well as to learn from important developments in education, science, medicine and psychology since Steiner's death nearly a hundred years ago. I'm originally from the UK. I met Anthroposophy 33, 34 years ago in a school for handicapped children uh, near Reading. It's now a ward of school. At that time it was a, a special school. Some severely um, disadvantaged children there. And I worked as the gardener. And my wife worked as the cook. And for me, meeting the work of Rudolf Steiner was like um, finding water in the desert. Most of my teaching in Waldorf education has been in Australia. And in the last few years of still teaching in Australia, in the 90s, 
I already started to come to Asia during my holidays and made contact with various very grassroots initiatives beginning the Waldorf schools. And little by little this grew and now I work full time really um, and particularly now in China and Taiwan. What is the response then to Steiner in that part of the world? It's exploding. It's phenomenal what is happening in China at the moment. It's, I would say the people or the people who come to the, the, the training courses and seminars and the initiatives that have started in China, those people, I would say, are hungry. They're really hungry to find meaning in their lives. They're, they're hungry to connect with the outside world. And they're deeply grateful. That is my experience. And this is what gives me energy. The mainstream education in China is very, very tough, very, very competitive, and uh, you know the, the children, they, they are forced to study from very young, from kindergarten back to two, three years old, and uh, more and more parents realize this is not what they want. And actually, you know, like the world of schools and kindergartens, most in initiatives are parents. In India, as elsewhere in the world, what increasingly concerns many parents in particular is the stress their children experience, both in terms of the pressures of living in the modern world, but also the pressure of having to achieve, to score points, tick boxes, pass exams, all with the aim of eventually getting a good job. But in the opinion of many people, coming far too early in their lives. At Sloka's kindergarten in Hyderabad, the emphasis is on a very simple and rhythmic routine of creative play and stories, or simply having time to watch and wonder. As little children, they cannot differentiate between play and work. For adults, we know that there's a play time and a work time, but children, play is as important because it's all imitation, that they imitate whatever they see. And actually, if they're like, I'm cutting fruit, they could be, you know, cutting an imaginary fruit there, but they're actually doing it. It's, it could look as play for us, but for them, it's real work. What Steiner emphasized when he founded the first Waldorf school in 1919 in Stuttgart was that childhood has distinct phases and the children not only have to grow up and learn the ways of the world, but also need time and space so that what each one brings into the world can unfold harmoniously. Trailing clouds of glory is how Wordsworth expressed it. Though some of the baggage we carry on our backs, maybe from past lives, is often far from glorious. Simple and unhurried. It is this atmosphere that is attracting more and more parents to Waldorf kindergartens all over the world. Here in upstate New York, in the Hawthorne Valley Waldorf School, I came across this growing awareness that if childhood is eroded, we are diminished as adults. There's a story, uh, I think it's from Zorba the Greek, about him uh, holding a butterfly that's just come out of a cocoon and wanting to uh, see it fly. So he tries to blow on the wings to dry the wings before their time, before they're really strengthened and ready. And the butterfly ends up crumbling and unable to really fly and, and, and its time was not yet come for it, so we're giving children time. Rudolf Steiner never visited America, but he did travel extensively in Europe during the last 20 years or so of his life, delivering over 6,000 lectures, as well as writing books, plays, and a collection of meditative verses. 
Walter Kugler is in charge of the archive related to Steiner's work up until his death in 1925. It's housed in the basement of this building, across the meadow from the Goetheanum in Switzerland, the center of the anthroposophical society that Steiner founded. It replaced an earlier wooden building which Steiner designed and worked on with an international group of helpers for nearly eight years, and which was destroyed by fire on New Year's Eve in 1922. Steiner drew up plans for the replacement, this time made not out of wood, but of concrete, but he never lived to see its completion. In the following years, he traveled all over Europe, lecturing and writing on esoteric subjects such as karma and reincarnation and cosmic evolution, as well as planting seeds, practical indications for renewal in all areas of human life, including the arts. But Steiner was not only occupied with sharing his increasingly profound spiritual experiences and with the creation of new architectural and sculptural forms inspiring artists such as Kandinsky and Joseph Boyce. Despite problems with his health, he continued to travel here on a visit to North Wales in 1923. By now, he was becoming deeply concerned about the situation emerging in the aftermath of the First World War, politically, socially and economically. He feels that humanity is in a great battle. And he's trying to help, try, really trying to save, save evolution from the dead end. Or one-sidedness. One-sidedness is a dead end. If it's unbalanced, it will, it will break, it will crash, and it will bring terrible suffering. Well, see, Steiner feels we have already been through terrible suffering. There is terrible suffering in the world, cruelty. People, you know, starving, that's an unbalance. So he's very interested in economics and in the proper way for a, a government and a community to, to form in order to, uh, really to save people from, from starvation and also from meaningless work. Great, great concern. He's not a Marxist, but he drank from that cup. He knew that Marxist critique of capitalism has some profound truth to it. It's a cruel system. Totalitarianism is also cruel. We haven't found an uncruel system, but that's what he was looking for, where the, the, uh, the economic, the political, and then the whole cultural sphere would work collaboratively in their respective spheres without anyone taking over the other. But in the West, but particularly in the United States, the economic, of course, is just far more powerful than the other spheres controlling education, even religion. This is, for him, this is a great, great concern. Economics points to banking. And the concern expressed by Steiner nearly 100 years ago and echoed by Robert McDermott that the economic sphere has got too big for its boots has increasingly become the concern of many. Here in London, at the client day of the UK branch of the Dutch-based Triodos Bank, are both customers and bankers who are trying to work in a different way with money. Greater transparency, greater responsibility, and greater consciousness of how the money deposited is actually used. Peter Blom is chairman of the executive board of Triodos Bank. I'm convinced that banks should look more at what is really needed in society, and then make out of that a feasible business. And then you need some profit, of course. You cannot do without profit, but you don't start with profit. Profit is the result. And I think that was also something what relates strongly to what Steiner always said. Uh, profit is not something you aim for. Profit is something what is a sign of a healthy operation. It, it's emerging from a healthy transaction. 
And that is a much better way of looking at profit than s s putting it there as a goal, as an objective, and make everything work for that goal. With Steiner, he always had the human being in the back of his mind when he was talking about economics, about medicine or whatever. And that is an important element what, what we can learn about, because most of the thinking now, we exclude the human being. It's about the system and the human being should fit into the system. And what he did is was saying, well, let's take each human being as a starting point. Let's design something around that, what can work to serve human beings. And that deeper principle, I think, is quite important. And you cannot achieve that by just copying what he has said or just repeat what he has said. I think that's the challenge. Maybe not so much for him, but for us to work with what he has brought to us. What Steiner brought was frequently in response to questions and to requests from individuals or professional groups, teachers, farmers, priests, artists and doctors. In April 1921, he gave a three-week lecture course for a group of medical practitioners in Dornach, his base in Switzerland during which he gave the first detailed and systematic introduction to anthroposophic medicine, and also spoke about mistletoe as a remedy for cancer. The essence of all such gatherings was the quest for a deeper understanding of the human being, without which, said Steiner, it has actually become impossible to investigate the true nature of health and disease. Steiner worked closely with the Dutch doctor Ita Wegman in bringing his insights about health and disease into practical application. And already back in 1912, together with his second wife, Marie von Sievers, and in connection with the mystery plays he was writing, Steiner had brought into being a new art of movement, both as a therapy and as an art form that he called Eurythmy. Zone. Du strahlend tragende, deines Lichtes Stoffgewalt zaubert Leben aus der Erde unermesslich reichen Tiefen. Bravo! Dieser hat einmal nicht den den rechten Fuß gehabt nur gemacht. Yeah. We are working with speech and we are working with music, but in such a way that we try to be music and be speech. Be music is more understandable because you have belly, they work with music, but they don't really go into the laws, if you can say that, of the music, the different elements of the music. But in tone eurythmy, you go into all the elements of music and you become them. Yeah, ganz richtig. Genau. Dr. Steiner calls it visible song. So that what is singing, what you hear in the music, that is what we are trying to express. And with speech, the same thing. <laughs> Welten Kräfte, sie verführen dich. So the movements are, are very precise. You're not ad-libbing them. No? no, not at all. They are really born out of the elements of music. Yeah. And, and speech. And speech too. You have yeah. the vowels, you have the consonants. What we usually use when we speak, and we don't think about it, that it's possible also to express through movements this speech. Herz, du Seelentragendes, deines Lichtes Geistgewalt. Nur hier haben wir das Gleiche wie vorher. Margareta Zolstad leads the Eurythmy Ensemble based at the Goetheanum in Switzerland, the centre of the now worldwide Anthroposophical Society.
Eurythmy may not on its own save the world, and the shape of the Gertianum may not be to everyone's taste. They are, however, attempts by Steiner to waken people's awareness to what is seemingly hidden behind the world of appearances. Eurythmy explores this other dimension in both music and speech. And for Steiner, it was not a case of spirit or matter, heaven or earth, but rather spirit and matter. There is only one world, but it is infinitely more complex and many-layered than a purely materialistic mindset is willing to acknowledge. Over many years, through a combination of diligent meditation and an open heart, Steiner developed the natural clairvoyance he was born with into a faculty that made possible what he called spiritual science, a way of seeing, open to us all, that goes beyond our sense impressions and a narrowly focused intellect. To help awaken the spiritual in the human being to the spiritual in the universe is how he once described his task. In other words, the human being is, potentially, as the ancients taught, a microcosm of the macrocosm. Steiner was no longer silent, no longer alone, but he paid the price. He had stuck his head above the parapet and was shot at from many directions. In the ten or so years to come, until his premature death in 1925, at the age of 64, there were indeed triumphs, but also tragedies. Yet despite exhaustion and illness, Steiner continued in his efforts to remind us of our evolutionary potential and that we are not alone in the universe. Indeed, that we are made in the image and likeness of God. Some listened, some not. Herein lay the challenge, both for him and now for us. Yeah.